Hello, welcome to video four for week two. In the previous video, I talked about how to calculate a Taylor series expression for a function involving calculating the derivatives at the center point and factorials. Uh, let me remind you what that formula was. I'm gonna leave it here, up here on the left since we're gonna use it all throughout this video. Here I wanna do some examples of calculating these Taylor series for some well-known functions. And I also wanna use those examples to solve some problems that we weren't able to solve earlier in the calculus, thus showing the use and power of Taylor series to solve problems. Let's start with the exponential, one of the most important functions and one of the nicest to work with. So according to this general form, I need to calculate the higher derivatives. Well, luckily for me, the exponential function is its own derivative. So all derivatives of the exponential function are just the exponential function. I need to choose a center point. I'm gonna choose a center point of zero. So I'm gonna evaluate the higher derivatives at zero. Let's just e to the zero. All the higher derivatives are one. So this term in the numerator is just one. I set alpha equal to zero. I get this form for my Taylor series for the exponential function. In the first video, I said that sum n equals zero to infinity one over n factorial is equal to e um, in, in week one in one of the videos. Well, now I can justify that by just saying, well, take this expression here, evaluate at x equals one, that's e to the one, that's e. So that is just a special case of this particular Taylor series expression for the exponential. If you wanna see a bit more what this looks like, you can sort of write it out in expanded form. See, we've got those factorials in the denominator two, six, 24, um, and these powers in the numerator. Another thing this does for us is this lets us properly define exponents for all real numbers. Previously, we knew what whole exponents were, whole positive exponents. Something to power three, you multiply by itself three times. Neg negative exponents meant division, putting things in the denominator, taking reciprocals. Fractional exponents meant root, so something to the one-third is the third root of that. But we didn't have any interpretation for irrational exponents. What does an irrational exponent mean? It's not a root, it's not a power. Now we do. I want to know what e to the pi is. Well, it's just exactly the value of this Taylor series. No more and no less. And that might be a little bit obtuse and hard to interpret compared to the interpretations of rational exponents. But that's all right, at least it's a clear and formal definition of what these things are, what they mean, how we can actually calculate them. I can also prove that the exponential function is its own derivative. Now this might be sort of circular because I assumed it was its own derivative to calculate its Taylor series, but I can at least show you that the Taylor series matches that property. So if I write this Taylor series and take its derivative, I differentiate term by term, the n comes down, my new exponent is n minus one, I lose a term, the constant term goes away, so now I start at n equals one. This n cancels off the first term of this factorial, leaving only n minus one factorial, and then I'm left with this expression. Now I have n equals one in the index and n minus one in the term, so I can do a shift from here to here by subtracting one from the index and adding one to n in the term, so n minus one becomes n equals n equals one becomes n equals zero if I shift the index down and I shift the term up, these n minus ones become n and I recover exactly the same series as I had before. You can see this a bit more explicitly if I sort of write out the first few terms. So here are the first few terms. If I differentiate them, I differentiate them term by term. Derivative of one is a constant is zero. Derivative of x is one. Derivative of x squared over two, the two comes down, cancels off, I just get x. Derivative of x cubed over six, the three comes down, cancels off to six, I get one, I get a two in the denominator, and then what's left is x squared over two. The four comes down, cancels four over 24, the same as one over six, I get x cubed over six. And I, in that way, build up again exactly the same series as I had before. So the derivative of e to the x is in fact e to the x. When we talked about integration, we said that there were integrals that should be defined the integral of any continuous function should exist, but weren't necessarily expressible in elementary functions. And the classic example of this is e to the x squared. There's no elementary function that expresses this antiderivative. It's not a sine or cosine or hyperbolic or exponential or logarithm. It's some other type of thing. Taylor series let us access a lot of these quote unquote impossible integrals. 
So the Tato series for e to the x is this. It has a radius convergence. I don't think I mentioned this, but it has a radius convergence of infinity. It converges everywhere, which means that I can put in a number or I can put in a number squared and it's still going to work. So if I put in e to the x squared, I get this Taylor series. I just replace the x with x squared, x squared to the n by laws of exponents the same as x to the 2n. So this is a Taylor series with only even coefficients. This Taylor series still has a radius of convergence of infinity, so it defines the function e to the x squared. So if I want the antiderivative, I can just integrate this Taylor series. And then I'll get a new Taylor series. It's going to have odd terms. It's going to have n factorial over times 2n plus 1 in the denominator. It's going to be whatever it is. But it is going to be then an expression, a Taylor series, for this previously impossible integral. And we can study it via that Taylor series. We can see what its values are. We can approximate it. We can try and graph it. We can do all sorts of things. So this gives us access to a new function that we wanted to have access before, but we couldn't have access via the elementary functions that we already had. Let's move on to some other examples. Calculating coefficients using this form, this general form, is the most common way to find Taylor series, but it's not the only way. We had the geometric series. I used this as an example in the first video for this week of a powers of a series as a function. So this is also a power series, powers of x to the n, and it encodes a Taylor series of this function. It's equal to 1 over 1 minus x, at least on this limited domain, absolute value x less than 1. I can integrate both sides of this. If I integrate the left and integrate term by term, I get some new Taylor series. If I integrate the right, and I'll skip the work, this is a logarithm. And if I set both of the constants equal to 0, which I certainly can do, I get that this logarithm can be expressed by this Taylor series. So this is sort of an indirect way of getting a Taylor series for some other function by using a known Taylor series and doing various things like derivatives and integrals on it to find some other Taylor series that I might not have previously known. It has the same domain, so this is also an expression of the logarithm of 1 minus x for absolute value of x less than 1. For one last example for this video, let's talk about the sine function. So if I take the derivatives of the sine function, I get sine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine, and then I loop back around. I have a pattern of derivatives. If I evaluate these at the center point 0, say I want to center my, my series at 0, I get 0, 1, 0, negative 1, and then I loop back around. So I get a pattern of derivatives, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, so forth and so on. All of the even derivatives are 0. All of the odd derivatives are plus or minus 1. So I can express them, if I write them as 2n plus 1, well then with n equals 0, I get the first one, n equals 0 is, is positive, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, I get negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So I can put that into this form if I match that up with the power of x minus alpha. From here, alpha is 0, so just the power of x. So in the general form, the factorial in the denominator, the degree of the derivative, and the exponent are all the same. So if I match this and this and this as all 2n plus 1, I get this general form for a Taylor series for the sine function centered at the origin. This one only has odd terms, and that's fine. Um, its radius of convergence calculated by the ratio test is infinity. And you could do the same thing with cosine. Cosine would be offset. We would start here with the 1 and 1, 0, negative 1, 0. So all the even terms would be 1s and negative 1s. All the odd terms would be zeros. So we would encode the even powers instead of the odd powers, and you'd get a very nice Taylor series also converging for all real numbers for cosine. Taylor series for sine, cosine, and the exponential function are three of the most common that are used. Uh, so perhaps become familiar with their forms and see if you can recognize them when they show up later in the course.